everybody. My name is Shushmita Mandol. On behalf of the German Consulate General Kolkata, I welcome you all to the third web -based session of our science lectures. These lectures aim to further strengthen the cooperation and collaboration between Germany and India on science and technology and research. This is a platform and Indian scientists to share their research, the findings with other scientists, academicians, and any other interested individuals. Today, there will be lectures. The first lectures, Porous Framework Materials, Can a Car Run on Water, will be by Dr. Rahul Banerjee of ISAR Kolkata. And the second lecture, Spider-Man Technology from Vision to Reality will be by Professor Thomas Scheibel of University of Bayreuth. Let me now hand to the moderator of this session, Dr. Shyam Shen Gupta from the Department of Chemical Sciences, ISAR Kolkata, and a former Bull Fellow. Dr. Shyam Shen Gupta, please. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Mandal, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I am Shyam Shen Gupta, and uh, I am the moderator for this session. And um, I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the German Consulate of Kolkata uh, for this um, interesting session which we have put together. Um, if I want to put a general theme of this session, uh, I could sort of say it's basically eco-friendly materials. Um, and, uh, and there are two lectures and two sort of sort of slightly different uh, way we have put these two lectures. The first uh, on, um, on porous materials, um, which basically synthetic inorganic organic porous materials, which are, I would say, nature inspired. Um, porous inorganic materials, you know, have been in nature for a long time. Zeolites, some of you might have heard lot of uh, examples in, in, in the industry as well as in even daily uses, things like um, soaps and stuff like that. And, um, and so Rahul will talk about uh, getting inspired from these natural porous materials, he, how he has created uh, a new generation of synthetic porous materials, which will probably can imagine, which, which we can sort of now dream about running a car with water, right? So, and that's, uh, you know, functions which, you know, you, natural materials would not make. And, and so that is something uh, which, which, which Rahul will talk about. Um, the second one uh, talk um, is really a science fiction which has come true. You know, growing up, everybody would have seen Spider-Man and you would want to become Spider-Man, right? And that's, uh, that's like everybody, every child's dream. Um, what Thomas has done is has, has made it into reality. And you could see that, you know, learning from this uh, spider web, he has created, you know, this material, which is called spider silk. And, and he will talk about the different applications in both healthcare and hygiene, what he could do with this sort of, uh, this sort of materials. Um, for the students who are hearing this, uh, the common theme which you would see is, you know, these are basically materials which is directed towards a technology, but they're based on very solid, high quality basic science. You know, uh, both these people started, you know, by looking at very fundamental questions, you know, ask very fundamental questions about in material science, and then basically took this, you know, into a real life application. So these, this is how I would say you would really learn to see that, you know, you could really ask basic questions and you could really translate them into something which is very useful. You know, that uh, would be, would I'm sure that you would sort of see this in, in, in both the lectures. Um, so before we start, I want to mention a couple of things which uh, uh, to which have been already emailed to you. The speakers have roughly 25 minutes, and the question answer session uh, will be after you know after uh, the both the talks are over. So please type in your question on the chat box and mention if it's for Rahul or Thomas, right? And so then I will collate the questions and I will put it together to the to the speakers. And if we are out of time, then you know I will email them, and I'm sure the speakers will be happy to to, to answer them, and then we'll sort of forward it to you. Um, the other thing is uh, we have seen in some of the previous lectures uh, that you know when the speakers are presenting, mistakenly some people have sort of clicked what is called the present now, and and that you know sort of stops the presentation of the speaker, and you sort of presenting. That's a bargain. I think Google Meet, and we can do nothing about it. But please do not 
press present now when the speakers are presenting. You know, I would really repeat once again, please do not present, you know, click that present now button when the speakers are presenting. All that we'll do is that take out the card and then the person has to log in again. So please keep this in mind. And um, and as I said before, uh, the uh, the community we will sort of you know uh, moderate the question answer and and please put your questions and and please tell who the question is directed towards. Now with this, um, I will uh, sort of uh, uh, start introducing the first speaker. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Rahul, uh, whom I know for a really long time. You know, we are both colleagues in National Chemical Laboratory. We are actually neighbors. Okay. And I've seen him, you know, start his research and 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 grow to the stature he is currently right now. Uh, Rahul did his PhD with uh, with Gautam Desi Raju in University of Hyderabad, and then did his postdoc at uh, UCLA with the um, um, uh, UCLA. And and you know, he has been uh, a pioneer in, in porous materials, especially metal organic framework. And then he has actually started covalent organic frameworks in India, and uh, and he is. In our generation, absolutely the most cited chemist. You know, there's no question. Um, uh, he has published several papers. He's been well recognized in India, nationally and globally. You know, he has got the Swana uh, Jayanti Award and the Shanti Shabur Bhatnagar Award. And Rahul is also the associate editor of the RSC's flagship journal, Chemical Science. Um, and um, and with this, um, I would request Rahul to upload his presentation. And and he's going to talk about porous materials. Uh, can a car run in water? Okay, Rahul, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shyam. And uh, on the very outset, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, the uh, the organizers, especially the German consulate uh, consulate for this uh, kind opportunity. When uh, Shyam came to me uh, that I need to present, uh, I need to present something uh, towards an audience which is, uh, I mean, very diverse. I was a little bit uh, concerned. But then, you know, uh, then I thought that, okay, let us uh, give it a shot. All right, so without, uh, uh, without further delay, let me start uh, the presentation. Uh, let, let, me, let me go to the pointer mode, okay. So we, we will today discuss something about uh, uh, something, some, some aspects of making porous material. But before we start, I would like to show uh, one uh, very interesting picture that I have, I mean, uh, that I have first seen from uh, Professor uh, Shibram when he presented a very beautiful talk at uh, ISAR Kolkata. So this looks like an actually an iceberg. It's a very famous image or famous, very famous photograph that has been taken, but it's actually not an iceberg. I mean, it's a, it's a problem, it's a, it's a trouble, and it's a challenge for, um, uh, for, the, for the entire, uh, entire chemistry community, I would say, uh, the entire civilization. And this uh, image has uh, has picked up a lot of attention, uh, attention all over the world. And uh, I think people say that uh, these are these are going to be, I mean, uh, the problem and the trouble for um, for the future, for the future generations. That uh, that we will circle back to this uh, this slide later, and there I will I will discuss a little bit more. Okay. So coming back to porous materials. Porous materials, what, what exactly is a porous material? Uh, as uh, Shyam said, we are surrounded by porous materials. These shirt, all the clothes are porous. I mean, uh, zeolites, as Shyam said, bricks, wood, those are all, all the porous, especially bread and cake. Uh, these are all porous material. I mean, you know, in the log time of lockdown, a lot of people said that, you know, Isaac Newton invented the calculus. I mean, there are a lot of jokes around. So someone asked me, what did you invent? I mean, during the lockdown, what did you learn? If you, I mean, I figured out that during the lockdown, I learned how to make uh, Indian bread from scratch. So if you ask me, that is the thing I learned during the lockdown. If you come to ISAR Kolkata, I will most probably be able to cook. Uh, I mean bread. I mean that's the only thing, only the bread. I mean nothing else. So that uh, uh, that that part. So these are all porous materials. Bread, cake. Uh, these are all porous material, and we are surrounded by, as I said, by porous material. So the concept today is, and and as I would like to continue, if you still don't uh, don't believe me, and today these days we are all wearing these masks. You could take one particular mask, any 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 mask, any fabric mask will do. Even N95 will also do. You cut a piece of it, put it under a regular optical microscope, 
and you will see that very nice ordered uh, structures through which we breathe in air and uh, we we filter out as many as many things as possible so these are uh, these are some of the aspects of porous material that we have been we have been dealing discussing these days i mean and and looking into so today as i told you that i am going to discuss something about the porous structures so the porous structures uh, that we make in our laboratory uh, is inspired by a simple concept that you take a joint uh, you connect that particular joint via some kind of organic strut and together you make a gigantic structure out of it and uh, individually they mean really nothing but when you combine them together they form this beautiful gigantic structure and that could be utilized for i mean a lot of different purposes if you are still uh, um, uh, guessing what if this guy is really talking about and what is this uh, strut and what not i would like to just say this is a porous material too just you can see organic strut the strut they are connected by a joint and together you make this beautiful architecture which can host uh, the the durga pratima which is you know hopefully in a month month and a half i don't know uh, so this is a big festival for uh, for our region uh, so this is also a porous material so i think that made uh, that i have cleared up little now today what we are trying to talk about is that a very simple concept of running a car from water i'm sure those who are, who are i mean listening they are thinking i mean it is absolutely impossible which actually it is not uh theoretically there are a lot of examples that if you take uh, water if you split it into um, hydrogen and oxygen there are a lot of work uh, is happening on water splitting then you store that hydrogen into a particular container and then bring it back to the fuel cell and react that hydrogen with oxygen again you will get the water back so very simple objective water split it to hydrogen and oxygen store the hydrogen get the hydrogen into a fuel cell and um, and and use it and react it with oxygen get the water back but there is a slight slight issue here issue is let's say i can split water using sunlight let's say say i know how to do it using sunlight i get the hydrogen i store it into a tank uh, in a car that hydrogen i pump it into a fuel cell fuel cell technology i'm going to show you that uh, that in germany and other parts of the world people are running trains using fuel cell you know so uh, so that hydrogen i i bring it back i react it with oxygen i get the water so it is a fairly simple looks very simple concept however however let's say we are in mohanpur which is roughly about give and take uh, 75 kilometers from kolkata uh, airport not the city so uh, so if i go to airport and i come back it is 75 plus 75 150 kilometer in order to do that with the current state of the art technology fuel cell if i just use if i just use the hydrogen gas then i will need i will need a container i will need a container and I, and where i can store 1 kg of hydrogen which will be roughly of a size of 1 meter diameter balloon so you can imagine i mean these days i mean the, due to lockdown maybe the traffic is a bit light but uh, when you know we, we we run the car and there is no space and uh, and i mean it's not feasible to put a balloon next to a car or or behind a car and run it so keeping people thought something else that okay let's think in this particular way i have seen lot of people when i travel to europe and uh, and also in india uh in india in a different mode so in europe i have seen people take coffee and then they take cake and then they dip the cake uh, inside the coffee and uh, and they sort of eat the uh, the coffee in india on the other hand i have seen people dip a biscuit uh, in the tea and then they sort of eat not drink not to drink i repeat not drink the tea okay so sort of eat the tea uh, using the biscuit so what they do is they soak the liquid inside the solid adsorbent in this particular case biscuit and the cake both are porous material they suck up that uh, that liquid and then you you take it and then you you consume it so people thought that if we have to uh, store the hydrogen which is the lightest element in the periodic table into a container in the mode of gas because please understand that you cannot liquefy the hydrogen that is going to have the another problem i am going to i am going to discuss that 
So if you can store hydrogen into a container, if you need to store, you need to use this technique of dipping the cake into the liquid. In this case, it is the gas. So you can use porous materials like activated charcoal. We do use activated charcoal in our household for purification of water, tent, aquaguard, urocophobes, those kind of things. They give, um, they give, I mean, where you use uh, activated charcoal to purify. We could use uh, caltrates, uh, metal hydrates, and also synthetic zeolites, uh, microporous polymers. And what I said just now, we are going to discuss something about the metal organic framework. So what exactly are these metal organic frameworks? If you take simple uh, PET bottle, polyethylene terephthalate, you disintegrate it, you get terephthalic acid, the monomer of the PET bottle. You react it with zinc oxide, which is the ingredient of the sunscreen over here, mineral sport sunscreen and zinc formula, non-greasy. So you pick up this uh, zinc, uh, that is the metal, and, and you have this organic, over here, you mix metal and organic and create, and you create a framework like this. Like I told you, joint to another joint and to another joint and to another joint. So you create a structure. I'm going to show you in a minute uh, how that works. It precipitates, so you react that organic and with the metal. So metal and organic, and you create a framework. Like uh, just now I showed that beautiful Durga Puja Pandal. So a metal organic framework, very simple nomenclature. It precipitates as white powder. It precipitates as white powder, which you can identify and crystallize and get this structure identified where you have this once again, the repeat uh, joint connected to another. How exactly these materials work? Let me try to see if this slide uh, works out. Uh, yes, it does. So this, they, these, uh, these crystals, these uh, solid powders, if we could zoom them, I mean, zoom in, we will see these beautiful crystals. You can see it in YouTube, in BASF website. This I have copied from there. So this is the real crystal structure of the material, uh, as you can see over here. And this is, and then when you expose it towards the gas, it will just suck it in, exactly like the cake. And then it will hold the gas molecules inside the framework and then together, I mean, and that will be useful for storing the gas molecules, molecules inside a solid container. So this is the principally the way this metal organic framework or the porous materials work. So you store the hydrogen inside this, I mean, you, you fill up a canister with this metal organic framework solids. You purge gas in, the gas molecules will be stored over here, you know, inside the, inside the porous solids, and you will be able to absorb more amount of gas than uh, the empty can container would have. So coming back to hydrogen. Now let us let us come back to the hydrogen. We uh, people are we are using hydrogen. We are using hydrogen uh, hydrogen in many different avenues. For example, in our laboratory in either Kolkata or many other places in NCL, we used to use the hydrogen cylinders. We we use hydrogen uh, for hydrogenation reaction or many other reactions. So in laboratory we do use hydrogen. So we can store hydrogen in a simple cylinder, like I told you, like a gas. But that if we use to run a bus or a car or even, I mean, you know, I dare say the train, then you will go a few meters and then it is, it is, I mean, it's done. So you need another cylinder and then you need another and then what? And it goes on and on and on. So second, uh, second could be the liquid hydrogen. Very good. Very, I mean, you know, very high volume density. But extremely expensive i mean you know you can only use these kind of technology as a rocket fuel as a solid fuel kind of uh, in those kind of places i'm not going into too much of detail but uh, if, you, if you, you can imagine that you know liquefying hydrogen which is the lightest element in the periodic is going to be expensive i mean there is no other other way coming back to it the third objective is the solid adsorbent that is the that is the point that we have been discussing now so far so now, this is the, I mean, you can see, if, you, if we could store the hydrogen into a container, if we could store a lot, then already we do have the fuel cell technique, fuel cell technology. This is the, this is the uh, uh, Kuradia, you know. So this is a train which Germany, they are running using this, as you can see, this is the hydrogen over here, you know, and, 
and this is the hydrogen powered fuel cell powered uh, train that they are running already in our country if we have to bring in we have to bring in a technology which is cheaper which can be affordable to everybody and so that the ticket prices and other things are are much more uh, much more easier to afford so so this is the technology is already there you need a material to store a significant amount of hydrogen to so that we can run a train bus or, or taxi using that fuel cell technology Okay, so solid materials for hydrogen storage. Okay, we have been discussing that, and uh, as I have already told, that many different materials can be utilized, and we are going to discuss about the metal organic frameworks. People have already started working on uh, storing hydrogen using metal organic framework, and there was a lot of different work going on and still going on around the world uh, in storing uh, storage of hydrogen. So then, uh, in, in uh, around 2008 or so, uh, Department of Energy decided that you know let us try to have some boundaries. Or said, let us try, try to have some some conditions uh, that we need to or targets that we need to fulfill. For example, if you are taking a cylinder, if you are taking a cylinder and you are filling up with solid adsorbents, it should take about six weight percent of hydrogen. Which means, which means, if you take a hundred gram of solid adsorbent, it should absorb six gram of hydrogen. It's still not exactly six weight percent, but let's take it in that particular. Case. The second is your operating temperature should be, you know, anything between minus thirty to plus fifty. Which means it must work in Alaska. It also should work in Calcutta in summer. So it should work. You cannot say that I have a car which runs only in Alaska. So that's not not going to work. Pressure cannot be more than 100 bar. You know, if you have a very high pressure, then the, the cost and other issues will will show up. I'm sure many of many times we have seen uh, uh, in Delhi or other places uh, in roadside the car is burning because they use a compressed natural gas that is a methane storage, and uh, and and often the, the, that catches fire. In hydrogen, that won't happen because hydrogen has a, a very tremendous escape velocity. Cycle life, it has to be 1,000 cycle refueling time, etc., etc. But these are some of the some of the boundary conditions that we need to fulfill. So, in using metal organic framework, what people have thought that okay, all right, now we have made this nice solid adsorbent. We fill this solid adsorbent into a, a empty canister. You may probably think if I have already filled the canister with completely with solid, now how on earth the gas will uh, come inside? I mean, how is it possible? But in in reality, believe me, in reality, if you fill it up with with solid, and I'm going to explain to you how. So if the if this uh, solid it is filled up with solid, then what will happen is this solid can take up. This is the adsorption of hydrogen at uh, let's say around 20 bar pressure of an empty canister, and this is the filled one. And you can see that at the same pressure, you can get up to almost three times of hydrogen stored. Inside that uh, that canister, which is filled with the solid. Now, obviously, the question will, of course, linger: that how is it possible? This is already filled with solid. I mean, where is the gas uh, going? So, let us try to get an idea: how is it happening? So, this is the empty canister, hydrogen gas. Remember, not the liquid. You are not pressurizing it too much. It is still on the gaseous form. It needs uh, some place to anchor. Uh, so the gas molecules so and most of the uh, canister or most of the cylinder is empty okay fair enough i don't like the empty spaces i need more gas inside so i change uh, the cylinder wall and i make some you know partition okay i i kill as much as possible uh, this black space and i i uh, you know uh, increase the more gas molecules coming Take these gas molecules. Take these gas molecules. How do I know? I have stored a decent amount of gas. So take, if we could take the gas molecules, each and every one of them, and put it into a, let's say, a flat surface, one after another, then probably you will cover a surface, let's say, one meter by one meter. So the surface uh, are covered by this hydrogen or any gas molecule for say, is one meter square. Now let's say I change. Sand to kill to kill uh, the the white space inside the cylinder. Sand will enhance the surface, so more number of gas molecules will be uh, absorbed on the surface or on the, the boundary of the surface. And you fill up with sand. Let's say I, I have taken one gram of sand, and I have absorbed some amount of uh, gas molecules. 
and then um, then if we if i take that out once again and i can get a surface of let's say 10 by 10 so 100 meter square surface per gram of sand something like that this is a solid adsorbent i'm talking about if you take a metal organic framework not only it can take on the outer surface but it now can also take on the inner surface as well and that's the beauty of these materials now if you take it out now you can have 100 by 100 which is 10000 meter square i mean just think how big is our salt lake stadium or you know or allianz stadium I and mean, you can see the about the about the size and that's the beauty of this material and that's the that's the charm of this material and that's where uh, these materials uh, stand apart compared to other other um, other uh, materials that we are using now here is a slide uh, which is uh, which is uh, mostly for the chemists and the you know physicists and engineers so here i want to just simply say that uh, if you ask me that how do we really measure that how much amount of gas has been uh, soaked in so it is very simple concept so suppose if i say that uh, okay uh, there are a bunch of people uh, standing next to a auditorium and i ask someone of you that please tell me how many seats are there inside the auditorium but you cannot look inside so what you could do is that you could ask these fellows that you please go and take a seat each and every time take a count 1 2 3 4 4 and then at some point someone will come uh, go in and come outside and you will tell that there are no chairs so you know the number so similarly you know the the amount of gas molecules can go in uh, has been measured by using boyle's law which we have studied uh, i mean in high school so p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 so we know p1 and p2 we know v1 to start with and then from there we figure out how much it has been absorbed by v2 measuring the v2 so it's the simple way to do it i mean this is sort of the technique we use in 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 general compared to uh, compared to the state of the art material why this material has uh, has picked up so much attention and those uh, if you are still uh, uh, believe that you know i am bluffing or i am just saying for the sake of saying just type in google metal organic framework just type i mean you will see youtube videos uh, publications you know technology company etc etc i mean on this subject one by one I mean, you know you, you just you, you can just give it a shot after the presentation is over i mean just if you don't uh, still believe me the reason these materials have uh, picked up so much attention because there are choice you have lots of choice compared to the state of the art they are also beautiful material they are very very useful please don't say please don't think that why i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not uh, i'm not saying that these materials are of no good they are extremely useful zeolites are extremely useful for carbon capture and they are been we are using zeolites in our households porous carbons we use in our tele, i mean cell phone you know so uh, these are very very useful materials but this they are there i mean we can see there i mean we have plenty of opportunities in this sector as well only considering the fact that they have such a humongous surface and humongous and porous uh, structure and with a lot of empty space for us to use and utilize so choice so lots of choice you know i i will miss if we i mean i will feel we will all feel really sad if this year there is no uh, such thing in our place but uh, we will probably accept it uh, but choice is important and that is where i mean i will finish my uh, presentation but saying that uh, that when you have a materials i mean this kind of materials you can just do a very fine tuning i told you na that metal organic framework so if you change the metal you make a new metal organic framework. if you change the organic a metal organic framework also so you can do permutation combination and you figure out the material that you want for your purpose whether it is household or for the industry and i'll show you some slides you don't need to really bother about the uh, bother about the um, the types and i'll show you few examples of this and you have i mean choice after choice just take a look at it you know i told you the yellow ball represents the porosity just keep on keep on looking and you can see you have choice a plenty and it is up i mean it is up it is only your imagination and your belief that will uh, that will help you to make a desired material for uh, for your your um, uh, your utilized so i will more or less uh, i think uh, we'll finish uh, finish up here mm, i wanted to discuss little bit about uh, the 
about the carbon capture but i will finish off the target again so metal organic framework and these were the targets that we had a discussion metal organic framework can actually do all of these all of these they can it can achieve all these targets except one it can only work at 77 kelvin it can only perform for hydrogen storage at 77 kelvin which is minus 200 degree centigrade temperature and that's and we cannot run a car at minus 200 degree centigrade temperature that's not feasible and if uh, young i mean uh, workers uh, researchers are looking at it this is a problem for the future this is a problem that uh, world will uh, i mean world is in dire need of that you store a material and you create a material for storing hydrogen at room temperature so problem i would say for the future co2 uh, as i said i would skip the co2 part uh, just to say that we don't really need to tell that you know uh, co2 has a big problem i visited uh, tata steel uh, a few uh, years ago couple of years ago we have been working with tata steel uh, for co2 capture and they have a huge problem of co2 and that would be another day of uh, i mean another lecture another time and they use this ethanol amine uh, they and uh, these amines they and they bubble the co2 inside the amine and when they bubble the co2 this amine becomes the imide salt and and then they have to regenerate it it's it's not uh, it's not you know, i mean they use it but they are looking for a new technology and and they came to me and uh, and uh, they are also working with other people that if we can make a mof material which will absorb the co2 inside a container which later they sell to the beverage industries you know so where we uh, where they use it the coke pepsi and 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 other things this co2 but the more, most the problem they face is that the co2 they need to release in the atmosphere and when i visited their place and i saw these pipes through which co2 is coming in and if you really i will put a scale to scale so that you know what is the dimension of the pipe please see the truck and the pipe and they said that can we fill the mof in the pipe and i am thinking if i have to fill this mof material that i am making in the laboratory in this pipe then you know our students their children their children children will keep on working and this pipe will you know probably never fill so we need to have a new technology to to make these materials in, in kilogram and ton scale to fill up this this pipe with, which people are really working on to some extent we are also in our laboratory but that's another day another lecture another time and uh, i think i will probably wrap it up by showing that the how gigantic these these problems are when you take it to the industry and uh, and and uh, it is a completely new level new generation and a new a new way so i hope i could give you a overview of these porous materials uh, you need to make these materials uh, which is with inexpensive you you can probably make a crystalline or non crystalline ones it has to be porous it has to be chemically stable uh, otherwise it will not make much sense as you can see these pipes and water and all kinds of you know ingredients that will pass through it synthesis has to be very quick because we need it today we cannot wait uh, you know few years to get it and you have to be used you know able to make it in different bead shapes etc etc what it can do i have discussed about the hydrogen storage so many things you can really do with these porous materials and even people are now trying to use the amino acids and calcium to make the porous materials for the edible purpose for eating uh, for uh, treating this cal calcium supplement or replacing the calcium supplement i think that with that i will uh, probably close uh, these are my uh, students uh, funding agencies and collaborators they are uh, they are greatly acknowledged and uh, and uh, and in isr kolkata of course uh, of course and once again i would like to thank chayam shen gupta my colleague and the german consulate for their kind invitation and the opportunity to really really uh, really deliver uh, i mean hopefully it was not too boring and uh, believe me i mean uh, i didn't know uh, till 2018 that uh, bmw stands for bavarian motor works you know i had no idea i only saw the cars in tv and you know really felt that one day i will own one but that did didn't that day didn't uh, uh, you know appear yet like the material for hydrogen storage but i hope that Well, with this lecture i could entice you all of you to work on the problems like this or the problems for the industries or the problems for the for the future with that 
I'd like to thank you all and thank once again the organizers, especially Shayom and, uh, and the German consulate colleagues for their kind invitation. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you, Rahul. Uh, can you just quit the presentation? Yeah, um, so uh, thank you very much. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, um, I would uh, once again thank Rahul for this uh, excellent lecture. So please type in your questions uh, in the chat box. And and then I will uh, uh, I will uh, uh, I will ask them at the end of the end of the lecture. Okay. So um, so okay. So uh, now we move on to the uh, next lecture, and the, the, it's also a, actually more of a privilege to and a pleasure, of course, to to introduce uh, uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Scheibel. Um, I was a humble fellow with. Uh, uh, with with Professor Scheibel, and when he was in uh, Technical University Munich. And uh, Professor Scheibel did his uh, diploma and then his doctorate from University of Regensburg, uh, working uh, with uh, Professor Dr. Johannes Buchner. Um, and, and then he went to uh, MIT to work with Susan Lindquist. And, and, and I always found it very really exciting that you know, he worked on uh, amyloids. And, and, and then you know, using the same concept, he sort of brought into, and that was more for you know, disease purposes. And he, and he used those concepts into. Uh, looking at uh, such kind of uh, intrinsically disordered proteins and he moved into the spider silk and he has uh, built up a like absolutely like you know things which i'm sure he will look into he will speak about it and this is really like science fiction and and he has been uh, a professor right now university professor in in university of Bayreuth. um he has had several awards uh, using including the carl heinz bickerts award the dakema award the max buchner skiftum and the innovation award uh, awarded by the Brazilian Prime Minister. He is in the editorial board of, of several uh, journals. And he's he's also founded the company called AM Silk GmbH in Germany. And I'm, I he's going to talk about some of the stuff in which this company makes. Um, and um, and and so it's over to you, uh, Thomas. We look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Sam. So it's it's really a great pleasure. And um, big fun and thanks well to the consulate and to Siam for for this really kind uh, invitation uh, but also thanks to Raul so he already made now the connection to Bavaria so you saw the Bavarian cars and uh, I also have another connection which I show you in a few slides uh, which is very funny because we didn't talk about our talks but but there is a, a red line uh, in between yeah so thanks for the invitation and um, I will start sharing now my screen fully. Yeah. So do you see now my screen? Uh, no. No. Get back here. Do you now see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. All right. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, um, yeah, here you see one of my co-workers, and it, it has not been Siam, so um, it was great pleasure having him in the lab. Uh, but you see here one person in a Spider-Man suit, and you will see even uh, another person later on in a movie. Um, the title of the talk is Spider-Man Technology from Vision to Reality. And uh, of course, I would like to give you some insights into our motivation. Um, why we think Spider-Man technology is cool. Of course, we, I, I will tell you a bit about what is Spider-Man technology. Um, I will talk a bit about yeah, our ideas, um, which is kind of the vision, uh, and also some type of reality. So are there uh, products um, available? Um, but let's start um, uh, in the beginning with uh, fibers, because this is what we're mainly interested in. And this is kind of a, a, a time um, time chart showing you how um, 
actually the innovation in the field of fibers has developed over the last uh, decades and that we have right now a big gap. So if you have a close look um, in the 19th century, people mostly used natural materials to actually generate new uh, fiber applications, which are um, actually in, in the um, regime of textiles, like with jeans or waterproof uh, fabrics. Uh, rayon is, is one of these materials. And then there's a gap, so no new fibers have been developed in between. And then in the era of industrialization and uh, with a lot of materials chemistry in, uh, innovation, in the 1930s, people started to make now polymer fibers, yeah? like nylon made by DuPont, polyester, Velcro, spandex, Gore-Tex, to name just a few of them. So you see here time span from 1930 roughly to 1970, where a lot of innovation has been done. A lot of new fibers um, have been produced. But since then, actually not much really happened. I mean, all new fibers that we use nowadays are actually just derivatives of the stuff that has been invented roughly 70 to 80 years ago. And therefore, I put here a question mark. We started in 2001 working on spider silk, and there it was a clear vision. Everyone that I asked told me, don't do it. Yeah? All of them told me, lots of companies have tried also to make spider silk. They all failed. Don't do it. So at that time, it was a big question mark. There it was really vision. Can we make spider silk in the laboratory and even on industrial scale? And can we use it for something? So that was the, the main idea. Then for some years, the interest in spider silk dropped a bit. But, and this is now the connection to what Raoul said, nowadays we are pretty much aware of that polymer fibers, that plastics, might be a big issue. And this is a slide that I have took, uh, um, taken from McKinsey uh, for the World Economic Forum in 2017, where they made a very rough calculation. So this is not scientific numbers. This is a rough calculation that um, they estimated that in 2014, the plastics production was roughly 311 million tons. Um, and if we had a look in the ocean, the ratio of plastics to fish by weight was roughly one to five. As I said, these are not scientific numbers. This is an estimation. If we continue to upscale our plastic produ uh, production and look at the year 2050, roughly 1.1 thousand million tons of plastics will be produced. And if we find no way to recycle the plastics, of course also, uh, the, uh, the rubbish, which means the plastics in the ocean will increase and the ratio of plastics to fish in the ocean will be then beyond one to one. In other words, we might have more plastic in the ocean than fish. And one of the problems is that, that plastics do not degrade very well. And that's a big issue. And this now makes it so interesting to get back um, to spider silk because Spider silk is a natural material that is 100% made of proteins, and proteins can be very well degraded. So spider silks could be a solution for this recycling problem that we currently have on plastic fibers. So now let's have a, a close look and silk at all, because it's not only spiders, and of course the best known silk producers are silkworms. Um, you see here the silkworms, and they typically produce the silk for making a cocoon, and this is very well known in India uh, and in other uh, regions of the world, and, and this is the silk that we typically use for textile applications. I have to mention that there's other insects like honeybees and wasps and lacewings. They're also uh, able to produce silks for different applications, like for housing, for breeding, and the silks have different properties. So here we see structural properties of the proteins because they're all protein-made materials. And you see here significant differences just by the pictures. Even if you're not acknowledged uh, with, with protein structures, you see they, they look different. They perform different. They, they're used for different applications. The 
world champions in, in silk production um, are, however, spiders. Why? Because spiders already, by nature, use silk for different type of uh, applications, for braid catching, for um, egg cases. If you just even look at the spider's web, you find different types of silk strong fibers, elastic fibers, glue. This is all made of silk, but with completely different properties. So therefore, we started um, almost 20 years ago working on spider silk because this fascinated us uh, for the simple reason that a material can be used for so many different things. And most funnily, spiders just recycle their stuff because if they move on, they take down their webs and they eat it which is exactly what we need for recycling, right? So if we actually could eat our shirts or our shoes after um, we use them, then we would have no um, rubbish and no dumpster, and then we would not have plastics in the ocean. That is sort of the very visionary idea. So let's have a closer look at spider silk. So as mentioned, it's a fiber made of proteins. And you know proteins from your body, our skin, our hair. This is all made of proteins. Spider silk fibers, they're special because they're mechanically very strong. And I will have one slide on that later. On the other hand, they are bacteriostatic. And I also will uh, talk about that. Um, because if you have a close look at the spider's web, you will find no bacteria on top. This is um, uh, very surprising. So they're actually sterile. And we wanted to know what, what this is. And I will tell you about the story, which just has been published um, two weeks ago. Um, and one of the main authors is Sushma Kumari, and she's also in the audience. So hello, Sushma. Um, Interestingly, spider webs have been used in medical applications since centuries because it has been well known that they support wound healing, they don't cause inflammation, they don't cause an allergic response. And this is very surprising because typically, if you have a foreign protein, put it inside a human body, you get an antibody response. But not if you have spider silk. It has sort of a stealth modus. If you put it into the body, the body doesn't see it, and it does not care about it. And therefore, we don't have inflammation or allergic responses. So to say, we have a super material. Good mechanics, sterile, and actually supporting uh, the healing of wounds. Now, if we talk about spiders, and this is a picture I've just taken um, before the COVID breakdown in, in, in Brisbane a Museum, um, are spiders dangerous? Uh, have you, we um, uh, take care of, uh, 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 of spiders. And here is a clear signature that tells you, no, if you look at the causes of death in Australia in 2013, you see 44,000 died on cancer, 30,000 heart disease. Snakes, four deaths, sharks, two, spiders, zero. Spiders are nice creatures, so to say. Um, so therefore, you don't have to be afraid of spiders. Um, they're nice. If you leave them alone, they don't even touch you. Now, let's get to one problem. If spider silk is super, well, then you just have to keep a lot of spiders uh, in a spider farm and produce a material, right? That would be the idea. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Here is the reality. So you see a female spider and you see the other spider and it's already almost eaten up. Spiders are cannibals, or most of the spiders are at least. So therefore, if you put them together in a spider farm, that does not work. They kill each other. And therefore, um, in comparison to, to silkworm silk, you cannot actually produce spider silk uh, by just having a lot of spiders in one place. That's a big difference to the silkworms. Um, so the material has these extraordinary properties, but you cannot use spiders for making it. And therefore, we had to start think about another technique. And this is what we call the Spider-Man technology. So this is now the explanation of what it is. So what do we do? Well, we want to produce spider silk without using spiders. What have we do, uh, done in the past? Well, we had to identify the genes, the genetic information of the proteins in the spiders. And once we uh, identified the genes, we had to slightly adopt it a bit. We did some design like an architect. 
Um, and then we put these designed genes in the transport vehicle, which is called a plasmid. And with this transport vehicle, we could actually now uh, insert the genetic information into uh, a bacterium. And we use, for instance, Escherichia coli, which is a, a bacterium that we also have in the human body. And the bacteria have the advantage that we can actually produce them large scale. So we have fermenters with up to 120,000 liters, so even bigger than the pipes that Raoul has shown, um, a lot of bacteria growing in there. And we can actually now, um, in, uh, in other words, tell the bacteria we trigger the production of spider silk. So here we make the raw material. Importantly, the bacteria cannot make fibers. Yeah? They just make the proteins. We have to make the fibers, and, and that's, that's the, uh, the cool thing. And I promised you to show you a bit more about Spider-Man, and here is a short movie. And this is done in our laboratories. So you see, I, I know Spider-Man in person, uh, and here we meet. And actually, um, I can tell you, well, this is my son. So we had a very uh, fun day uh, where we actually worked um, together with a film crew. And here you see the spiders um, hanging on their threads. Yeah, so that's the real stuff. Um, and we want to do the artificial thing. So is it possible to make fibers out of a protein. So this is how the protein looks like when it comes out of the bacteria. It's then, it's then dried, it's freeze dried, so it's a white powder. How can we make that? Well, this has been a long process. Uh, it took us almost 15 years to actually solve that question. And to make a long story short, nowadays we are able to biomimetically make spider silk and it has now the brand name BioSteel although it's 100% protein made. And I mentioned the mechanical properties to begin with. And one really intriguing me uh, uh, mechanical property is the so-called toughness. What, what does toughness mean? Well, toughness is the energy a fiber can uptake before it breaks. Here you see natural spider silk of this European garden spider, and it has a toughness of around 150 megajoule per cubic meter. If you compare that to our best performing man-made materials like a carbon fiber, Kevlar or nylon, you see that spider silk is really superior. This is the really outstanding mechanical property of spider silk. And here you see the very first man-made protein fiber that really can compete with the natural one. So this is the performance of BioSteel and it really performs mechanically as the natural spider silk does uh, in terms of toughness. So we have been able to produce that in the laboratory. Um, and also, um, Saya mentioned it, we founded 12 years ago a biotech company named MSilk, and they actually were able to scale up the processes. They could scale up the process for the production of the raw proteins, and they could scale up fiber production. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, this allows us now to actually look for applications. And applications uh, of these biosteel fibers, they will be definitely plastic free. They are lightweight. They have a very good microclimate control, which is well known for silks. In our case, it's even vegan because we don't need spiders and animals anymore. So this is made by bacteria only, which is a really very important factor for a lot of different industries. It is odor resistant because bacteria don't stick to the surface, as mentioned, and I come to that in a minute. And it has a very good moisture management. So this actually um, are very appealing properties that you can use in textiles industry. And some of you might have seen the presentation here. So this is a prototype shoe and we're looking forward to get that now in series production next year. This is something we did together with Adidas, and you see that the upper shoe here is 100% biosteel. Just the sole is made of plastic still, but we also work on that, uh, that we can actually replace the plastics here with something biodegradable. The funny thing is, if you don't like the shoe, you literally can eat it up, yeah? Uh, and that makes this material really interesting. Uh, it's fully biodegradable, and, um, 
it's also lighter than uh, an average other shoe, and, and therefore we think this is one type of application. Unfortunately, this is not on sale so far. Uh, we're waiting forward to that, but there are other products that are available. For instance, an armrest for a watch, and you can buy that through the online shop, um, which actually has very interesting properties if you have neurodermitis or other skin um, uh, related uh, diseases because spider silk, as mentioned, has these wound healing properties. And, and actually, if you, if you have problems with arm wrists or with other arm wrists, the spider silk arm wrist might, might help uh, to actually avoid that and, and allows you to, to actually wear a watch. Um, and of course, we also could transfer um, these properties into a lot of cosmetic products. And this is just a subsection. I think around about 50 different products are currently on market uh, worldwide, um, which actually contain our spider silk proteins, not the fibers, of course. Now we have the proteins involved in um, nail polish, skin, hair care products, and so on. And, and this section has already been sold now to Givendor, which is one of the world's greatest um, cosmetic companies. So this is no longer handled by us. This is really handled now by a, a huge company. Uh, and you can buy these products now all over the world. So I'm the very first company worldwide that has consumer products which contain real spider cells. Um, now I would like to come back to, to this micropropellancy, and this is really a very a recent story, just published two weeks ago in Materials Today, and I'm very uh, happy that Sushma Kumari is in the audience because she was the first author of that paper, and I would like to guide you through uh, uh, the mode of action. So why is spider silk repelling microbes? Here you see a human body, and you see all these uh, entry points for microbes like uh, bacteria or uh, like yeasts. And the problem with these um, microbes is that they actually can get into our respiratory system or in our um, intestine. Um, and the problem is not that they are there. I mean, we're filled up with uh, microbes, but the problem is if the wrong guys are there and they start to make a biofilm. which means they form a that protects itself, sugar proteins, and this makes the whole system then resistant. And even with uh, Staphylococcus aureus, you know there are multi-resistant strains, and they really are severe. So one solution is using, as I mentioned, this not work with all these um, microbes. And therefore, another strategy is uh, to have so-called anti-fouling surfaces. What does that mean? Well, if you have a structured surface, and on such a structured surface, it works like, you, you might know the lotus effect. Uh, it works pretty much like lotus because here, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here, the bacteria and, and the other microbes cannot actually hold on to. If it's microstructured, there is enough room and space to, to stick to the surface, but not on the nanostructured surface. What we have been looking for is something that is on the one side microbe repellent, but on the other side still allow human body cells to adhere. So what we wanted to have is something that is bioselective, selective, because this can be used now in medicine quite a lot, in wound healing, because if our cells can grow, but microbes are repelled, that would be the perfect material um, for um, wound regeneration. So in, indeed, we could show, uh, and this is uh, uh, Sushma's work, that um, if we use human fibroblasts and put them in hydrogels of spider silk uh, and then add microbes, and this is pretty much what we call um, um, a, a post-operative infection. This is what typically happens if you put something into a tissue, microbes attack it. We can actually um, co-incubate these two, um, the microbes and the fibroblasts, with the silk and then check what happens. And to our surprise, the fibroblasts survive over weeks. Here it's uh, 12 days measurements, but bacteria and yeast, they cannot. 
So we could show for the very first time that our material is really bioselective. Human cells can grow on it, microbes cannot. So why is that now of importance? So here you see again this the setup. So we can actually use the hydrogels for this bioselectivity. The reason is we can actually 3D print this spider silk. And we can even 3D print it together with cells, and I'll show you that in a minute. This allows us really to generate um, tissue material that has mammalian cells inside, but that is sterile without any chemical treatments. What is it good for? Well, it's good for coatings of implants. And this is a quite old story where we actually coated a silicon breast implant with spider silk. And here, just half of it is coated to show you the effect that we really selectively can bind cells on the surface. We avoid an immune response. And therefore, we also avoid the formation of a capsule. And this capsule can also inflame and can cause what is called a capsule of fibrosis. And um, we could show that um, coating of silicon implants with spider silk prevents capsule formation. And this is even now um, has been in a uh, trial uh, three um, uh, clinical uh, uh, phase. And we are close to getting here now the, uh, through all the regula uh, regulatory steps. And hopefully, this product comes on market um, early next year, uh, because we really could show that we can diminish and lower the risk of a capsular fibrosis uh, when we have silicon implants coated with spider silk. But back to the 3D printing. That's another really cool thing, because you can 3D print spider silk right away without any additives. And here you see a real-time movie. Uh, the reason why this works is spider silk is um, shear thinning material. So it's pretty much like toothpaste. If you just open um, uh, the, 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 the tube, nothing happens. You have to squeeze it, then it flows. As soon as you remove the shear stress, it hardens immediately without additive. There's no chemical crosslinker in there. There's nothing in there. And here you see what we printed was an ear like structure. Um, and we really can actually print it in any kind of um, dimension. And we can implement cells. And this is called biofabrication. So what do we want to do with it? Well, we are actually working on several applications for um, one is the regenerating uh, uh, regeneration of heart muscle tissue. And here you see um, a heart after heart attack. And you see here this scar tissue that forms uh, because cardiomyocytes are unable to actually enter um, the tissue which is damaged. In other words, you only can repair a heart muscle when you print cardiomyocytes in place. So the idea is, can we repair heart muscle tissue with using the Spider-Man technology? And the answer is yes. So cardiomyocytes, they love spider silk surfaces. And in this movie, you see that they even start to synchronize. So all these yellow dots here show that the heart muscle cells, they start to communicate with each other. And they start to beat. And they synchronize their beating. And now we even have organoids, so tiny little droplets of these heart muscle cells in spider silk. And they continued beating for 60 days independently, just on their own, in a beaker in the lab. And this is sort of like our um, outline. So this is the next vision that we have. We would like to go with this type of material now really into patients. We would like to repair damaged tissue. Um, and by that, my time is up. I would like to thank by um, thanking all the people, the uh, funding agencies, our partners, our alumni. Here you see Siam. Uh, he's listed there. Um, and you for your attention. And of course, again, um, thank you uh, to um, the consulate and to Siam for um, setting up this very, um, very funny and very nice uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, as you as you have heard, you know this is really uh, super cool stuff. And 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 you know what he doesn't really talk about is the you know the amount of 
basic sciences he has done in nmr studies to understand how these proteins assemble you know and and it sort of you know years grinding work for years which sort of allows him to you know the, the, the years is spent into expression units i think i think those took a really long time of something which people thought you cannot years of understanding how you take a protein and how do you assemble them uh, so you know for most students you know this is uh, basically what you see is a culmination of years of grinding work as you see with rahul also you know years of grinding work in understanding how you make this framework material which will come to application so, so thank you very much uh, uh, once again you know these were really uh, awesome lectures i have some questions which has come in uh, so i'll go with rahul first and then i will uh, sort of uh, ask thomas rahul uh, there is one question how mechanical and real microscopic properties of the ad uh, absorbing material for example the distance between the absorbing sites uh, change uh, uh, after binding okay so the first question is about the mechanical properties of the mof mofs are basically a rigid material uh, and uh, when uh, the gas molecule comes in they are gas uh, in general so you pressurize it around uh, about uh, 40 to 50 bar sometimes you go to 80 bar so so this is still as a gas molecule and yes they give uh, to some extent uh, pressure to the um, to the inner core uh, inner core and uh, and then uh, this mop molecule because this is like a framework structure so it expands a bit but it's not too much and then when the gas molecule uh, goes out so it shrinks a bit but since it is a more sort of a framework structure so overall the mechanical stability of these materials are are pretty pretty okay because they are pretty rigid in, in nature they are not that flexible they are not like organic polymers and uh, the second one is the distance between absorbing gas so this is an important point so when you pressurize once again when you pressurize uh, to some extent uh, more than 50 bar depending on the gas depending on, on the um, on the uh, polarizability of the gas molecule with respect to the framework how they interact in general they interact with van der waals interactions and electrostatic interactions so depend on those kind of interactions generally what we have seen is that the average distance between two absorbing gas absorbing sites are basically their kinetic diameter so for hydrogen the kinetic diameter of hydrogen is roughly about 2.2 angstrom for CO2, it is 2.8 and, and so on and so forth. So for methane, it is 3.4. So roughly about their kinetic diameter. They don't, they don't go beyond their kinetic diameter, meet meter. And that is where this, uh, this surface area comes into the, into, into the picture. So roughly about their kinetic diameters in, in terms of uh, their, their binding. Uh, and it is related, yes, it is related to the absorbing, uh, absorbing quality of the MOF because not all of them are good for hydrogen storage. Some of them are good for hydrogen, some of them are good for methane, some of them are good for uh, CO2, and so on and so forth. So, so can the I have a question. Uh, so a related question, can I ask? Uh, no, can we, can we, okay. we only limited time and there are a couple of questions. So can you hold on for a bit? If we finish in time, I'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's one uh, from Gopi Dash. He, uh, he's asking that as a materials chemist, what do you think is the future of solid state hydrogen storage? So oh, yes. Like uh, uh, MOFs or chemisorb systems like metal hydride? Yes, and yes, so, yes, yes. This is a very standard question. This is a question that you get a lot. Uh, metal hydrides, metal hydrides are extremely good in hydrogen storage. They are absolutely phenomenal. They can take up a lot of hydrogen as a solid, and however. Please keep it in mind the following fact. They absorb hydrogen extremely fast. So that means that when they are absorbing the hydrogen, there is a chemical interaction. When there is a chemical interaction, there is a residual heat, right? When there is a residual heat, then your tank will become hot when you are purging hydrogen in. So that you have to sort of bypass because then you have to cool the tank. And uh, so this is a, that is a trick. On the other hand, the physics option, on the other hand, don't have those kind of uh, vis a vis problem, but but uh, they on the other hand absorb very less amount of material. So that is another another problem. So keeping that in perspective, uh, uh, you have to have a boundary uh, intermolecular interaction or boundary interaction, which is roughly about 25 to 40 kilojoule per mole. Uh, and 25 chemisorb is uh, more than 50. So you should have something like 
25 to 40 kilojoule per mole so that you don't generate that much heat you also absorb a decent amount of gas molecules inside so that's sort of the material you need to design and figure it out okay so uh, thanks rahul uh, question for thomas how do you kashwat choudhury is asking how do you convert the spider silk protein into fibers and is that referred to as biosilk yeah, so, so that's the big trick, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so first of all, we have to look at the uh, natural process because the proteins are stored at really high concentrations without um, assembly. So um, there are some, some triggers, so domains at the end, which control the solubility of, um, of spider silk proteins. If you want to make a fiber out of that, you have to change the structural state, the conformation of these triggers, this, this control units. And this is done by a drop in pH, by shear forces, and by salting out. Um, so in the spider, the proteins are pumped into an S-shaped uh, duct, and there actually phosphate ions are pumped in, so phosphate is a salting out. Um, uh, salt, then uh, the pH is dropped from roughly 7.5 to 5.5, and then also the water has to be removed, um, and shear forces um, uh, are applied because the, the proteins are pulled out. This is very complicated. Of course, this does not work uh, with a technical process. So what we had to find, and this is kind of the Coca-Cola recipe, yeah, which we don't tell anyone, uh, can we actually get the same, um, the same situation with something that is technically scalable? So this is a, a wet spinning process where you have to combine extrusion and pulling off the material, salting out, change of pH all in one, one place. Um, it has to be scalable. It has to work at high speeds. Um, in nature, spiders spin around, well, they can spin up to one meter per second, uh, but for technical processes, you have to have 10, 20, 100 meters per second. If you want to have a technical process, I'm going to produce tons of it. And this makes it clear that we, we use the natural process as a blueprint, but we had to develop a technical process that is scalable. Um, and, and that is sort of the trick. Okay, so there's a, one more question, Thomas, uh, that Ranjan is asking. Um, so does the biodegradable nature conflict with the longevity? So it says it's biodegradable, but then shoes you would want it to last longer, right? So how do you sort of you know balance this out? That was a very big uh, issue with, with the companies that we work together. Um, the biodegradable textiles, not just for shoes, for everything, but they have to withstand washing. And I mean, in washing, you have also enzyme washing powder. Yeah, there's enzymes in there that typically degrade proteins. The cool thing with spider silk is it can be degraded by proteins, by proteases, by enzymes, but only by specific ones. And typically, you don't find them out there in nature. So these running shoes, they have been really tested now for almost four years uh, with everything you can imagine. And they actually very easily withstand all the natural enzymes and everything. However, as soon as you add a specific enzyme, so you can put the shoes in the sink, you add the specific enzyme, it's gone within a few hours. And the reason is um, that the surface of the silk molecules is very specific in its amino acid sequence, and it only can be recognized by very specific enzymes. So you have to have them around, uh, and then you can degrade the material. If not, it holds for quite some time. We even have shown that inside the human body. So you can implant silk with, with the silicon implants, for instance, and it withstands the degradation inside the body for up to 12 to even 18 months. But then the degradation starts, and after around 24 months, the silk is gone. Yeah? But these are really then very harsh conditions, because you have to imagine inside our body, this is really very restrictive. So everything that doesn't belong there is degraded. Um, so um, spider silk can be biodegraded, but selectively. And this is the, that's the answer. OK, so the last question, Thomas. So uh, Abrojit asks, uh, what is the flexural rigidity? He then writes in parenthesis, bending stiffness of spider silk. And then he has a follow-up question. That is, um, I think what he tries to mean is, 
um, do you think that this mechanical property uh, would change with production process, humidity, light during the production, right? Or, or I, I'm, I'm, I, I think he's trying to ask it how consistent is the production, basically. You know, in, in when you play. okay. So I, I I start with the first question. So so bending stiffness is not very high. So we have a Young's model is around between five and ten gigapascal. So if I would like to have a bending stiff silk, I would take and we also work on that lace wing silk because lace wings make X stops and they're quite stiff. And there's the idea to really use that as um, a counterpart for carbon fibers or other bending stiff fibers. So there are silks there in nature that are bending stiff, uh, but spider silk is not a good example for that. So that's part one. Part two, that's also a trick. And this is, I, I mentioned very briefly that we designed the molecules, right, to begin with, when we make our spider silk biotechnologically. The importance is that we have now fibers that are less responsive to the environment because spider silk in nature uptakes a lot of water. It um, is very sensitive to humidity changes. Um, and uh, this, of course, is counterproductive if you want to have um, high quality and reproducibility uh, in fiber formation. So actually designed the proteins that they still show some water management properties, but they're not that sensitive to humidity changes. Although our production process, uh, of course, keeps uh, humidity temperature constant. So we can tell, I mean, we roughly produced one ton of fibers last year that there is an indistinguishable um, um, uh, property between the fibers. So it's very constant. Um, and um, th this is based on the combination of the molecule design and the process. Okay, so uh, there's one more question for Rahul from Abrojit. Uh, what is the usual lifetime of MOF? How long does it survive? Like, is it, uh, do you think it's uh, with humidity and other things, does it fall off or? Okay, yes, uh, uh, if, if uh, you are not treating with humid uh, condition, then uh, most of the moths uh, do fall off after, I don't know, few cycles. Uh, but a uh, few uh, do st um, stand, uh, stand, I mean, there are few standalone moths which survive for a very long time. Uh, those moths people are actually now making, uh, making in bulk uh, production, I mean, going for the bulk production, uh, which can be used. Uh, for uh, commercial purposes. Uh, to be very honest, you can procure MOF materials uh, for, through uh, uh, Sigma, Aldrich, uh, and uh, Mark, those kind of companies. Uh, they're already, of course, BASF uh, also produces MOF, uh, but they don't sell it directly, but they sell it through these companies. So these are some of the MOFs uh, that can be uh, very good. Uh, so people do uh, make these days the MOF, uh, which are very, very chemically stable. And they, they take care of it in the beginning. So we have now uh, learned the tricks how to how to do that. But not often we are successful. But yes, most of the time uh, we can make a material which is very, very chemically stable. I could have shown few of my uh, award work which where we could stabilize a material in sodium hydroxide, water, and uh, HCl, and, and whatnot. So uh, yes, so you can make some MOFs which, uh, which are long-term stable. But otherwise, they are. Most of them are short lived. Okay, thank you, Rahul. Um, uh, so, if there is some question, uh, uh, we can just, uh, I can wait for like 15 seconds. You can turn your microphone on and you can ask a question. Otherwise, I'll just pass it over to uh, 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 Shushmita Mandal to finish it up. Is there any question? If, if there are any more questions, you can just unmute your microphone and, uh, and ask the speakers. I, I think it's fine. I think, you know, over to I have, you. I have a question. I have oh, there's a question. one question from Ranjan. Okay, go ahead, Ranjan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's it's on the comment that uh, these do not, um, these spider waves. Uh, the, my question is, to, of course, to uh, Professor Thomas Brun. Uh, the spider waves, uh, like when I go to a garden and often uh, spider waves brush my elbow, I develop a rash. So, uh, how do you explain that? Because you said that it doesn't, this protein doesn't react with uh, uh, human, I mean, it, it doesn't have any reaction. Yeah, so this depends on the uh, um, spider species, actually. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. There's roughly 40, 48,000 spider species known. 
Um, and some spiders, they're nasty because they use a coating on their, on their fibers, um, which, which is for them, for instance, important to repel ants because ants will crawl into the web and, and steal uh, the prey. Uh, okay. And therefore, some spiders, for instance, developed, and, and these are organic molecules, and they could actually cause really nasty irritations also on the skin. So this is really on purpose made by the spiders. It's not the fiber per se, it's a coating. Um, even some spiders have antibiotics in the coatings to, re to actively kill uh, microbes that get in. So um, it might be, so this will be a really uh, interesting example if you see such a web to, to look for the spider and, and uh, the, send me just a picture and we try out to find what type of spider that is because that might be also interesting to get a hold on these molecules because they, they also have some very specific properties in whatever and, and, and killing, uh, repelling uh, animals. Um, so, so that might very well be. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to you, Shushmitari. Uh, now I officially thank everybody. So on behalf of the German Consulate General, Kolkata, to our guest speakers, Dr. Rahul Banerjee and Professor Thomas Scheibel for such interesting and captivating lectures. I don't mean interesting in the German way of interest, Auntie. I mean English interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'd also like to thank our moderator, Dr. Shyam Shengupto, and the participant for joining the session and the, for the participation at the question and answer session. As you know, this session is available on YouTube at the channel of the German Consulate General Kolkata. Thank you, Riddhiman Ganguly, for putting the session on YouTube. I think here is also I need to thank whom the Pro Professor Shaibo mentioned, Shushma Kumari. Thank you for joining. And in a way, we also could see your uh, work. And uh, now I would like to express my gratitude to three former Humboldt fellows, without whose support this web science lectures wouldn't have been possible. They are Professor Pulakshan Gupto and Professor Ranjan Ganguly of Jadupur University, and the mod today's moderator, Dr. Shyam Shen Gupto from ISR Kolkata. Now, uh, I'd like to say that in order to ensure the continued success of this initiative to promote collaboration between Germany and India, and to expand the existing context in science and technology, you'd request active support of the science and research communities, as well as the science, research, and technology-based industries in both the countries. Our next web-based science lecture will be on 15th October. Please look for the invitation. And with this, we conclude this session. Thank you, and good evening.